Son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet. And I, Ezekiel, heard him speaking to me. Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious people, they will know that a prophet has been among them. But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Have you ever had it where you, you just don't know how to describe something you've seen or experienced? The way I like to frame something like this is just imagine with me what it would be like to take Benjamin Franklin uh, out of colonial America and whoop, suck him out of there in a time machine, drop him at Disney World right in front of the line, stick him on uh, Space Mountain, pull him off Space Mountain, and he's like, what just happened? Throw him back in the time machine, Boom, send him back to Mount Vernon, sitting around the table with George Washington and a little bottle of Madeira and saying, tell him all about it, George. You know, tell George all about it, Ben. And, and he'd be like, it was like space. And, and, and it was coming at me and we were going so fast. My hair was blowing. I couldn't see anything, but I could still see. Do you see how it would be like, how would Ben Franklin quantify Space Mountain to George Washington? He wouldn't know how to describe it. When we talk about the book of Ezekiel, what we understand is he very much is, is in that situation. He's a guy who got sucked up into heaven to see it. Now, he didn't physically get drawn up there, but heaven opened, he saw into it. And what he saw is fantastical, terrifying, overwhelming, it's, it's this like, I, if there's 3D you know, vision, then 4D experience, this is a 6D experience. There's dimensions he's trying to quantify and explain that are overwhelming. And we can look at the vision Ezekiel has in scripture and it says this, in the 13th month of the, in the 13th year of the fourth month of the fifth day, while I was among the exiles, um, on the Kiber, uh, I think that's how you say it, the Kabar River, um, the heavens were open and I saw a vision of God. So he's, when he has the vision, he is in exile in the, in the great empire of Babylon. This was a little north of in Syria towards Turkey where he was. And we know this, he's by the river with the exiles. And Ezekiel says, I looked and I saw a windstorm, which would have been very common and an easy way to describe uh, in familiar terms what he saw because they would see this in the sands of Arabia all the time. Big windstorms kick up, become sandstorms. He saw it coming out of the north, an immense cloud coming down, flashing lightning, it surrounded it. And in the inside of this storm, it's like molten metal. He's trying to describe what's, what's going on. There's this huge storm, but in it is this pulsating, powerful kind of light. And it looked like there were four living creatures inside of it. In appearance, their form was human, but each had um, four faces and four wings. Okay? <laughs> That's Spanish for what? Like, like seriously, he's trying to describe something. They look like humans with four faces. It's not human, that's weird, that's upsetting. But that's what he sees. So he's trying to put language to something. They had four faces, four wings. Their legs were straight and they had the feet of an ox. Do you see how he's trying to explain this? He's trying to get to it. He says their feet were like burnished bronze and they're these powerful looking creatures. Every one of them went straight ahead and they did not turn to the right or left. They went straight ahead. Their faces looked like this. Now catch this. 
their faces. This is the description he gives. And it's really kind of cool because it's the four great beasts of the domain, right? You have one with a human face. Well, one, each one had a human face, a lion's face, um, an eagle's face, and an ox's face. So there's these four faces. And um, they had... Um, wings that covered these faces at times. And, and they had two wings spreading upward, touching uh, the other creature on the right and left. And their appearance of these living creatures was like burning coals on torches. Fire moved back and forth between them. You can tell he's looking into something that is so radiantly powerful. The energy, the force, and all that's going on in this, it's hard for him to quantify. He's using terms. He's like, it's like fire fires dancing between them. It's moving back and forth and the creatures sped back and forth like bolts of lightning. I looked at those living creatures, it says, and then I saw a wheel. And this is pretty interesting to me because um, I'm a big Journey fan, the band Journey. Of course you are. If you're in Michigan, you gotta love Journey, right? What's the great line that was asked when uh, Freddie Mercury is asked, what, what, what's it like to be the greatest singer in rock and roll? And he said, I don't know, ask Steve Perry. <laughs> That's a great little line. I love that, right? But the song from Journey, the wheel in the sky keeps on turning. Oh, the wheel, I'm not gonna do it right now. But um, the, that song, I always wonder if this is a poll on Ezekiel, because the wheel in that he sees in this, it's beside each creature that has its four faces. He keeps coming back to that. He's like, that four-face thing up there, and, and he's pointing it out, and the wheels, um, they, they, they're made of wheels, but they're intersecting wheels. There's four of them, and at one point he says, and the rims on them are tall and awesome. So anybody who has a nice little whip with 20-inch rims, that's what he's talking about, these tall, awesome rims. But here's the thing, the, the, the wheels themselves have eyes dotting the rims, and they're looking out, they're full of eyes all around, and while the living creatures moved beside them, when they went up, the wheels followed, when they went to the side, the wheels followed. When they went down to the ground, the wheels would follow them because the spirit of the creatures was in the wheels. It's in these wheels. And they stood still when the creatures rose from the ground. And the spirit of the living creatures was actually in those wheels. Spread out above the living creatures was something that looked like a vault, like a giant bank vault. And it was spread out above them, sparkling with crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out towards one another and each had two covering their body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sounds of their wings and it was like the sound of like rushing waters, like boom, boom, just kind of shaking the earth. It was like the wind of the almighty, tumult, the tumult and march of an army when they stood still. They they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice above the vault. Over the heads they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault um, there looked like the throne of lapis lazuli, which is a, is a gemstone. And high above on the throne a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be from his waist up. He looked like glowing metal. He looked like he was just burnished and beautiful, glowing in the fire. He looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. Finally, he's able to give something like, ow, oh, a rainbow on a cloudy day. Yeah, I get that. They understand that. So it was radiance all around him. He appeared in what was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell face down and I heard a voice speaking to me. He had his Ben Franklin moment where he realized the awesome splendor of God is beyond human understanding and even human diction. So let's do something. Let's take a look right now, understanding that what Ezekiel was called to do was to unpack and describe things that were probably far beyond what language and comprehension can adequately provide to give understanding. But he did it well. So the book of Ezekiel was written between 593, which is about um, seven years before the fall of Jerusalem, to about 571. It was written um, uh, to the Jewish people who were living now in exile in Babylon. And um, it really, as a book, it's one of those things, if it was reviewed on the New York Times, they would say this, this book has it all. 
This has every genre in it. First of all, it has oracle in it. Uh, Ezekiel is speaking on behalf of God. He's speaking as an oracle, someone who says uh, words from God. In Ezekiel 33, 10 and 11, we see these words, and it helps us understand one of the oracles he gives. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? He's speaking an oracle on behalf of God, and we even see the heart of God. God takes no delight in that, their, their death. So what we see in this is he's speaking on behalf of God. So there's oracle. Then there's allegory, similar to um, like a parable like Jesus told. It's a story that applies practical things to a spiritual truth, and it symbolizes something. Um, for example, in Exodus, uh, Exodus, Ezekiel, Sorry. Um, in Ezekiel 18, he talks about the adulterous wife. It's an allegory. It's a way to uh, pin something up and give us context. Then he tells narrative, which is some of the book. He's just writing about what goes on in his life and things that are happening um, during the exile of the people of God when they're out of the promised land, living in the empire of Babylon. And then there's autobiography where he's talking about himself personally, his stories, and um, the moment of calling what God commands him to do so we can see that that that's going on in all these different genres. Oracle, allegory, narrative, and autobiography is going on within the book of Ezekiel. But what about the man Ezekiel? What about him? And here's, so let me ask, you have to raise your hand and participate. Any Star Wars fans? Yeah, we are. Uh, so, so let's do this. Remember back episode four, which is actually episode one, and you have to kind of be a nerd to understand that. Like if you're in say, your mom's basement, you're like, I get that. I'm like, yes, you are. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, episode four, which is actually episode one, Luke bumps in uh, to, this, to, to Obi-Wan Kenobi. And, uh, and so he's talking to Uncle Owen, his, his adoptive uncle. And, and he says to him, uh, something about Ben Kenobi and, and Uncle Owen looks at him kind of with his piercing eyes, you know. He's on Tatooine, so he's all leathery. And he looks at him and he says, what does he say? Does anybody remember? That old man's just a wizard. He's a crazy old man. I kind of feel like uh, Ezekiel is the Bible's Obi-Wan Kenobi. You mean that guy? He's just a crazy old wizard, some weird old man living out across the Dune Sea. That's what you would think about him because he does some really weird stuff. First of all, he gives himself a haircut. Which if you have kids and you've seen this happen where they're like, takes, there's like, <laughs> and they have like beautiful hair and then they have bangs that long and you're like, the mom's like crying like they were so beautiful. I'm like, well, they didn't cut their nose off. They just gave themselves a haircut. Ezekiel gives himself a haircut, I believe chapter five. And he doesn't do it with nice barber shears. He goes and takes a sharp sword. He cuts it up. He divides the hair into different things. It's all telling a story of how God's gonna scatter his people, but he gives himself a haircut. It, <laughs> it had to be a bad haircut. Um, then here's the worst thing that he had to do. In my opinion, there's a point at which God tells him to lay on his side for 390 days to every day to represent one of the year of their unfaithfulness. And he does this. But one of the things he has to do is he has to cook bread during this time. And he has to cook it on, um, on that thing that's brown and sounds like a bell. Dung. Oh, Yes, yeah, did you know that? In chapter four, God tells Ezekiel, you have to cook your food on human dung. And Ezekiel says, he's a priest. The man is a priest. He's never defiled himself. And he says, oh Lord, I have never defiled myself and done something unclean. Please let me cook it on animal dung. And God relents and lets him. I'm like, when you're upgrading to animal dung as your cooking fuel, it's been a rough day. People are gonna be like, that man's breath is rough. Why? Because he cooked his food on dung. That's what he had to do. So dinner on dung, he laid on his side, as I mentioned, for 390 days as a representation of, of the apostasy and wickedness of, of Judah and Israel. And then uh, when the light of his eyes, the love of his life, his wife died, God said, you are not allowed to mourn her publicly. You may not weep and go about the rituals publicly and mourn and grieve for her um, as, as a symbol of the way the people didn't grieve for their loss of relationship with God. And, and he had to do those th things that kind of made him crazy old Maurice, that made him look crazy to the rest of Jerusalem 
Jerusalem in the time when they were being besieged. And, um, but the reality is in doing this, he needed to tell people God, God's message, what it was regardless of their listening. He had to tell it, and whether they listened or not wasn't the issue. His obedience in telling it removed the guilt of himself, and it's a strange thing in this that you see that Ezekiel's obedience wasn't um, predicated on ministry success. It was obedience to God regardless of outcomes, and I love that about him. So what we know in this is he was obedient to God's message regardless of the people listening. Let's read Ezekiel chapter 2 verses 3 to 6. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the sons of Israel, to a sinful people who have turned against me. They, they and their fathers have sinned against me to this very day. I am sending you to these strong-willed children who show no respect. And you must say to them, this is what the Lord God says. If they listen or not, for they are a sinful people, they will know that a man of God has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or what they will say. Even if thistles and thorns are what you and what you sit on scor are scorpions, do not be afraid of what they say or lose strength of heart by their looks, for they will not obey me. God knows the heart of these people, but here's the thing. And in the book of Ezekiel, there is um, the gospel story hidden in it. The gospel is hidden in it. And here's the thing. First, uh, first part of the gospel is that sin must be punished. It must be dealt with. In Ezekiel 18, 1 to 4, we see how God views sin and says it must be punished. Check these words out from Ezekiel 18, 1 to 4. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the father as well as the son. It's mine. The soul who sins shall die. So what we know in this is um, it's a, what the, the sour grapes and the teeth set on edge is basically like saying, so your fathers ate, you know, ate raw chicken and now the kids are sick. And God's saying that's not going to be the proverb anymore. It's not going to be the proverb. God's saying I'm going to punish the sin of the person. I'm going to handle this because sin must be punished. But God does not delight in punishing his children, it's not a pleasure. As a parent, I know this to be true. It's no joy in my life to discipline one of my children. Because I love them, I do, but it's not something I'm like, boy, I wake up in the morning, boy, you know, I really hope one of them really messes up today and I can lay into them. No, that's not how it is. God doesn't delight in punishing his children. And here's how we can see it in Ezekiel 33, 10 and 11. Son of man, Say to the Israelites, so you see this theme emerging, son of man, speak, right? This is what you are saying, our offenses and sin weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of these sins. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn from their ways and that they would live, turn Turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? When we see that and understand, we know this. God hates death too. God hates death. It is not something he wants for us. He doesn't want us separated from life. God hates death too. God cries out, why will you die? Why will you die? I was watching a show um, with Erica, this, oh man, this was probably a couple months ago, and there was a scene um, that absolutely, like, it, it wrecked me. I was ruined for a few days by it. It was the scene of a dad, and he's looking into um, to this, this, this cancer treatment ward, and, and his, his boy had crashed. He was very sick with cancer, and, and he had died, and the dad screamed, and he like ran in. Oh, I can't even talk about it. He ran in, and he like grabbed him up, and he hugged him, and he was screaming no, and I was like, oh man, that is God. He loves us. 
And so often we have thought he wanted to punish us and he's the God watching us choose death and he's screaming no, running and taking us up, offering salvation because he loves us. Why? Because God desires to forgive us of our sins and not just forgive us of our sins, but to fill us with his Holy Spirit. He desires that. And we can see it again in Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. I love how the gospel's hidden in this. It says, uh, God speaking, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. You will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone, and I will give to you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit in you. This is so counter-revolutionary to the Jewish mindset. God's spirit doesn't fill people in their mind. It fills the temple, right? And he says, I will put my spirit into you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law laws. So when we say, how do we know we're sinful by nature? It's really this verse is saying, look, God's going to change what's intrinsically broken in us, our sinful nature. We are by nature sinful, opposed to God and willful. But here's the thing, since he loves us and he desires to forgive our sins and fill us with his spirit, we know that he's the God of new life and resurrection. He's the God who raises us to new life by putting himself into us. We become very, we're inhabited by God. His life breathing in us. He is the God of new life. He's the God of forgiveness and filling us with his spirit, but he's also the God of resurrection and new life. And we see in Ezekiel this profound moment, and I I think profound goes too short on it. The valley of dry bones, this vision Ezekiel has of the valley of the dry bones, and it is powerful when we look into it and see what's going on. It says this, the hand of the Lord was on me. He brought me by the spirit of the Lord, set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. Now, just real quick, you may think like, oh, that's kind of grim. But if you go to Stalingrad, modern day Stalingrad um, in Russia, if you go out around Stalingrad into the open areas, you will find bones littering those fields yet today from World War II and the siege of Stalingrad. The million plus German soldiers who died out there, they, they died and they were, they were eaten or decayed and their bones remain spread across that flat tundra around Stalingrad. It's crazy. So this is, wouldn't have been an uncommon sight in the ancient world where wars had happened. And he led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry and he asked me, he asked me a question, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, sovereign Lord, You alone know. Ah, such a good answer. You alone know. And they said to me, prophesy to these bones. Speak to these bones and say, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. To these bones, I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons and make flesh come upon you. I will cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. What was dead is resurrected. I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded. And as I was prophesying, I heard a rattling sound going on around. Sorry, I got to read it. I can't tell it. And the bones were coming together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then God said to me, prophesy, son of man, prophesy to the bones and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds, from all over. Come breath of God, the ruach, that ancient Hebrew word. That's what was moving over the waters in creation. Come breath of God and and four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live that they may live, so I prophesied as he commanded. Breath entered them, they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army, and he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up, our hope is gone, we are cut off. Remember, they're in exile, they're as good as dead. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. 
My people, I'm gonna open graves. I'm gonna bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the lands of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will sit, uh, settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. God will breathe new life into dry bones so that people will know this one truth. He is the Lord. God will put and breathe new life into dry bones so that people will know that he is the Lord. Here's the reality. Ezekiel did anything to share the message. The message mattered. He was willing to do his ministry to get their attention in any way. The dude cooked his food on poo, and I've said, right? He would do anything to do it. He didn't always have the words, but he tried his best to describe the glory and beauty of God. And we muttered that we just don't know what to say, and we give up. And when you look at that, you go, how can that be? That Ezekiel would go to any lengths to describe what he couldn't see, and we know The risen Christ is our Lord and Savior. We mutter, I don't really know what to say. But he would do all he could. And I think for us, the the message is, uh, is, is on us. It's incumbent on us that we know that it's our gospel to share out. And we must, uh, well, maybe we'll answer the question, what are you willing to do to share the gospel? What is God calling you to do with the gospel? I can guarantee you it's not sit and have a quiet faith just for you. The gospel is growth-minded. It is evangelistic, reaching out to all who are far from God. But I will tell you this, there's different ways about, that, about how that will happen. And for you and I, we need to know this. Asking ourselves, what is God calling me to do with the gospel? Deserves some quiet time following it to listen and then obey. My question would be, will you listen? And by listen, I don't just mean hear and let it go through. I mean listen and turn it into a verb and respond in your life. Will you live in such a way that the people around you will come to know who Jesus Christ is because of you? You live in a valley of dry bones. Will you speak to them? Will you speak the gospel out to them in your own way? And I will tell you this, some people are like, Eric, I don't understand my theology that well. I'm still learning in different things. Here's my invitation to you. You don't have to tell them everything. I suffered through nine years of seminary. Yeah, I said it, suffered. I, I'm not a great student, but I'll tell you this. If you will do one thing, if you will see, say three words, we promise to teach them the gospel here. Come and see. Come and see. It's the most ancient and effective means of evangelism in the world. Come and see the Lord Jesus Christ. Come and see his church living and active. Come and see the God who redeemed me. Come and see. Invite them. We'll do our best to share the gospel with them, but your challenge is to be someone brave enough to utter those three words. Come and see. Invite. We'll make room. We'll do anything we can so that one thing happens. The message of God is proclaimed out among the people and that many would turn and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the gift of your word, for the message we have. I pray that we would have it embody us, like it would, it would in, enter us and it would move in us by your spirit, that the gospel would come alive. It would be a flame in us that would be unquenchable and we would be a people who have to share the word of God. We wouldn't sit idly back and wait, but we would feel, feel compelled and, um, and, and pushed, even driven to obedience in following you. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the gift of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.